Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Common Sense Show. And I'm Micah, and I'm excited today because I get to speak to someone I've actually been looking forward to speaking to for a while. And he has revolutionized, in my opinion, the accounting um, industry, um, but not just how he does and delivers the accounting, but also just how he sees it work against how it used to work. And so one of my one of the things that I'm always into is, of course, is building businesses that are both effective and have good um, ideas about how they work and how they run and, and that are innovative. Because if you create faster than someone, someone else can copy you, then you have a good formula for success. So um, I'd like to introduce you to Jody Grunden. But before I do, let me give you a swoosh and then I'll bring him in. All right, so Jody co-founded Summit CPA Group in 2002, which merged with Anders CPA and Advisors in 2022. Uh, Summit, now a division of Anders, was the first fully distributed accounting firm as the leading provider of virtual CFO services in North America. Summit provides professional virtual CFO services for over 100 companies across the United States, helping business owners deep dive deep into financial side of their business to maximize profits, minimize taxes, and increase cash flow. He's speaking my language. <laughs> Jody is an industry, industry speaker and a published author, and he literally wrote the book on helping digital companies create a financial roadmap to success. Digital's do, di, di, digital dollars and cents, easy for me to say. Jody, <laughs> welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Micah, for having me. Awesome. So I have... Um, a ton of questions because I'm curious, but I, I like your approach. First of all, virtual CFO services. For a small business owner, are virtual CFO services out of the realm of attainability? At, at what point should a, a, a business be thinking about a virtual CFO? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, I get that quite often, actually. So there's there's many different levels of services, right? So you've got your back end accounting services, which are more transactional in nature, like you got someone paying your bills or doing invoicing or payroll processing or something like that. And then you've got somebody that uh, is responsible for actually making sure your financial statements are accurate, so that you can present them to a bank, an investor, you know that type of thing. Yep. And so those are what we call the accounting um, 101 or historical stuff. You know, that, that's what mm -hmm. accountants have always done and have done really well over the years. And I would say a business should have somebody like that from, you know, really maybe, you know, maybe three or $400,000 up to about a million dollars in revenue. So that's why I would say that, that that's where they should actually kind of focus their time and energy on, on that right there. Just making sure everything is cleaned up. And the reason why the business owners heavily involved at that point and they need to be a, a big part of that just so they understand how their business actually runs. Uh, once they get to that million dollar mark, I think that's when they really should start looking and make and having having somebody on their team that can kind of help them get to that next level. And that's where we start seeing that the folks will come on uh, with the virtual CFO service level. And I would say on average, I'd say a million dollars we see on the low end. And then it, it grows to about three million to five million dollars. You know, it, it's a definite at that point. Uh, where they need somebody to kind of really guide them, you know, through it, you know, creating a dynamic forecast, really help them do some modeling, you know, so that, and I don't mean the fashion modeling, I mean, you know, financial modeling, right? And so they're kind of helping you, um, you know, hey, how does the price increase impact my cash position in six months? You know, if I give raises to my team, what does that mean? You know, you know, all, all the different things that people are typically just kind of guessing, you know, that's where the, the CFO really, really helps out. And, and unfortunately, even at a million dollars or $5 million, uh, most firms can't afford to spend, you know, $250,000 plus for a CFO to be on staff. And that's where a virtual CFO concept really, really kind of helps that out. So it allows the, the small business owner to enjoy what all companies, you know, large companies across the, across the world have, you know, a CFO team on staff. So I talk a, a lot about, to to small business owners, of course, around the mm -hmm. world in general, yep. and it's basically the focus that in entrepreneurship of this of this channel, this podcast, and I talk a lot about maximizing profits, mm -hmm. trying to minimize taxes, increase cash flow, financial upside, all the stuff that you guys um, you pitch yep. um, at uh, at Summit, and 
what are some of the most glaring when you when, after you've onboarded a new a new customer? What are some of the most glaring mistakes that are affecting cash flow with businesses that you see? You know, I, I would say the biggest mistake is a lot of times they take the wrong approach. They think that they've got to drain their cash at the end of every year to to, to not have to pay as much taxes, and, and that is by far the the, the the wrong thing to do. Uh, yeah, you want to minimize your taxes, but you don't want to do it at the uh, at the detriment of your company. And, and so we tell our we tell everybody that you should have at least ten percent of your annualized revenue in the bank at all times. So real easy math, right? So if you're a three hundred thousand dollar company, thirty grand in the bank. If you're a three million dollar company, three hundred thousand dollars in the bank. So it's real real quick math. And there's actually some there's a, a real long formula that goes to prove that out. But that's just something everybody can kind of mentally do. And, and that's the, the lowest amount. Now, I don't mean to have that in an operating account, you know, not making any money, just kind of sitting around. You should always have about two paychecks in the bank in your operating account or maybe two cycles of a credit card if that's your biggest expense. And, and then the rest of it should be in an interest bearing account, whether that's a uh, interest bearing savings account earning, you know, one, two, three percent interest or, you know, something that's very liquid. And then uh, the third account you should always have is your your tax account, you know, because again, taxes are something that you're going to pay if you're as you know as as profitable as you are. So you should have a really good idea what your tax situation is throughout the entire year, setting money aside into that account and then paying that out, you know, throughout the year your, your you know your estimated payments and then you should have that dollar amount in there. So it's always kind of out of sight, out of mind. So you're never surprised right. or, or you don't use that money elsewhere. So I, I would say the fact that most most businesses do not have a, a, an operating account. They don't have. They don't have a cash reserve account earning interest, and then they don't have another account which is kind of set aside for taxes. Are the the three big ones? But the, the overall big one is they typically don't have cash in the bank. And, and uh, you know, with with our clients, they, we, our clients average about fifteen percent in the bank. Which yep. if you do the math, ten percent is two months of expenses for a service based company. Thirty mm-hmm. percent is six months. So you want somewhere between that ten uh, percent to twenty or thirty percent, which is like two to six months of expenses. What is the mindset typically that you've uncovered as to the reason why these business owners utilize essentially all the cash flow? Is it just a lack of organization? No, it's a lack of focus. Uh, they, they, they don't know what that end goal is. And so, you know, like when we tell people that, hey, you should have like 10 percent in the bank, you know, for those that have maybe three or four percent are barely getting by, they're like, yeah, I kind of wish I had that kind of money in the bank. You know, mm-hmm. you know, duh, that's why I'm here. <laughs> you know, that, right. that type yeah. of thing. You know, and it's like, well, it's because you didn't you didn't put a dynamic forecast in place. You didn't create the forecast based on real numbers, you know, based on things that you can achieve. Like if you're a repair shop, let's say you're a truck repair shop, semi truck repair shop type of thing. Well, you should you should know exactly how many trucks you need to come in every single month. You should know the average that you're going to repair for those trucks and the time that it takes to get that done. So you should be able to create a forecast based on the trucks coming in, which then equates to a revenue number, right? Mm-hmm. And then you should be able to back into the expense and then back into your overall. So you should know exactly where you're planning. And so when I come to an owner and say, hey, let's build that 10% and let's get it done within a year, year and a half. And here's how we're going to do it. The owner can, can, can see exactly the path now. They can see the goal and they you know, they go right to it. You know, it's, it's no different than, you know, you know, when I, when I say forecasting, it's no different than like the GPS on a car, right? You, right. You're, you're in Indiana and you want to go to Florida. Well, you know, you could go South and you're eventually going to hit Florida at some point, right? You're going to hit the ocean right. and you're going to figure it out. Uh, that's kind of what the typical business owner does. You mm-hmm. know, they, they, they know how to get there. They'll eventually figure it out. Yeah. But you know, yeah. if you have a GPS there that kind of guides you in, shows you where the road construction's at, moves you around the road constructions, shows you what you know all the different things that are going on in the in the in the bumps in the roads that are going to happen on that on that way to Florida, you get there a lot quicker, and you always you tend to you tend to get there, right? <laughs> and that's right. kind of that's kind of the key is they don't have that forecast. It's kind of helping them guide the ship. You know, it's um. Let's talk about forecasting uh, for a minute because what I what I've noticed is. With business, there there are hundreds of thousands of businesses in the U.S., maybe mm-hmm. a couple million, right, of small businesses. Yep. Um, and oftentimes, a lot of the the terminology that's used in economics and in MBA in graduate school are things that business owners are doing. They just don't connect the terminology with the action, and sure. but they're already kind of doing it in some way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the resources, for instance, that that you've seen that have worked out that are simple that business owners and entrepreneurs can use to understand the terminology with the action that they're putting in place 
Um, Investopedia is one is, is one website that that uh, is a is a pretty mm. um, a pretty like like lethal tool in terms of getting up to speed with terminology all the way up to MBA graduate level concepts mm. with explanatory videos. But is there something that you've used to educate business owners? Yeah, uh, another great question. Uh, you mentioned Investopedia. That's actually our go-to when it comes to hey, here, here before starting an engagement. If you want to get caught up on terms, here it is. Um, but in the same sense, we we as CFOs don't use terms. You know, so we're not going to wow you with all the cool knowledge and terminology and vernacular that you know that we've learned in you know MBA school and all that kind of stuff. You know, we try to. Yeah. We try to make it so that everybody understands because it, it doesn't do us any good to wow you. We want to make sure that we're on your team and, and, and we're, we're actually talking the talk that you understand. So like, like for instance, we could be talking about, hey, uh, your your churn rate in, in regard to the number of trucks that you're, you're bringing through is low. It's like, well, you know, hey, why not just say, hey, the, the amount of trucks is a lot lower than what you thought it was. Right. So if, if we can break it down so that we're talking the same language, and that's one of the big things that I learned when when starting Summit was to, you know, make it so that everybody, it, we're on the same plane. You know, I, I never yeah. want to be talking down to somebody. And so uh, the vernacular is not as important to us as the understanding. And, 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 and because we're meeting with clients on a weekly basis, Mm-hmm. They they understand they start to understand pretty quickly, you know. So they don't need to, they, they kind of go through an MBA program really yep. in that first year with us because they're meeting with us and going through stuff all the time. But we're really kind of helping them, you know, walk the walk. Awesome. And if you're watching this, um, obviously, if you're watching this on replay or on demand, we're listening to this on the podcast. You can't do this, but if you're watching this live and you have questions for Jody, um, just put them in the uh, the comment section of YouTube or or uh, Facebook, wherever you're watching this on, and we'll see if we can have them answer it. But so, so getting back to this, so forecasting is a crucial element mm-hmm. to long-term financial success and viability yep. for businesses, mm-hmm. primarily because it tells you how much money you, you are likely to have um, ceteris paribus, right? If all other things are held, con- all other factors are held constant and nothing changes, like how much money will I have at the end of the, the rainbow, mm-hmm. right? Um, if, if, if everything goes according to my plans. Um, so how, how can a business owner actually start forecasting on a simplified level, mm-hmm. like now? Like what kind of tips can you give for forecasting? Like the easy, the, uh, mm-hmm. the, Forecasting for dummy version. Yeah, no, that sounds great. So forecasting for dummies, and we, we kind of tell all of our CFOs, basically this is how we tell our, our CFOs, here's how you teach somebody how to do forecasting. You know, the, the, the first thing is you have to identify the, the the metrics that actually make the world go around, meaning what drives the revenue in your business? What drives net income? And, and so is it, you know, like I mentioned before, trucks. Is it trucks coming through? Well, how many trucks do you think you're going to have come through? And so I would take an Excel spreadsheet, dial it 12 months out there and and put down, Hey, what historically, how many trucks have I historically had come through January through December, you know, five in this month, 10 in this month, and then kind of look back and say, is that a normal thing or not a normal thing? And and then I would take and say, you know what, how much did I get from each of those trucks? So I just had five, let's say it's $80,000 a truck, you know, just throwing a number out there. Mm -hmm. And so then I, now I've got a revenue number. And so that's, that's, that's going to be the key thing there that revenue number. And then, then, then I'm looking for all the direct costs associated with it. You know, what's my materials typically, typically run for a typical truck? Is it 50%? Is it 75%? Is it 20%? You know, what is that? And then I look at my direct labor, you know, what type of direct labor has my team, my existing team, did they manage that last year or do I need to add folks? Mm -hmm. And and so then I'm getting into all those direct costs. And so the first thing is predicting that revenue because that's the biggest part of the forecast. And then any direct costs associated with that revenue. Once I've got that dialed in, then on a month-to-month basis, I'm going to look and see what are my administrative costs, what are my marketing costs, and what are my mm-hmm. facility costs. Those are the three buckets that we tell people to jumble everything into outside of your, your main costs. And so, you know, that administrative cost might be an office manager that you might have. It might be, um, you know, somebody that's not involved in the production process. Maybe it's the owner. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the marketing costs are going to be your, your biz dev team, your marketing team, any kind of advertising you're using, you know, it's going to be their all in cost. So if you've got a, an employee in there, make sure that you've got the cost of the employee, any kind of burden, which are the benefits that they might have 401k, all that kind of stuff. And then any right. really any, any costs associated with the marketing and then facilities, pretty simple. If you're brick and mortar, then you've got like rent or, you know, 
you know, real estate tax, insurance, you know, repairs, all the upkeep you have for your facility. And so you break all those out there. And so then now you've got them all broken out and mm -hmm. you've got it extrapolated over a period of time. You've got it all matched up. Uh, you should be able to get a pretty good idea uh, on the cash side. Now it's not going to be yep. perfect on the cash side. Your, your, your net income is not going to equal cash all the time, but it's mm -hmm. going to be relatively close. And, you know, the, the factors that could influence that would be how quickly you get your collections of your, your, you know, your payments and, and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff, how quickly you invoice clients, do you get paid right away? You know, that, that's a really big factor in cash. And, and then the other thing is, is what kind of debts are you going to actually, you're paying down. So cash isn't going to really be hundred percent on that number, but that'll give you a good number to base things on. And when you when you look at that bottom line number, that number should be for a service based company should be no less than ten percent. Mm. Um, it should be closer to fifteen to twenty five percent. So when you do your modeling, you know, kind of look down there and say, hey, is that number big enough? Yeah. And uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny because we talk about uh, service based companies and, and you know all the different industries out there. Um, you know, some industries think, well, hey, I can't be less. You know, my industry is at five percent. There's no way I'm going to make ten percent. Well. There is a way. You just kind of figure it out. You know, right. what, what, what do you have to do to get it to that number? And, and so once you've got that 10 percent and above number, let's say it's 15 percent. Now you've got something to really kind of base things on. Now, mm -hmm. the, the key to a forecast is once you created it and let's say you build it out in Excel and you created it and you're thinking this is pretty cool. Don't just leave it there. Don't look at it next year. <laughs> you know, don't look at it six months from now and say, oh, yeah. Right. I was way off in that forecast. Huh? How could I, have, you know, how could I have made that mistake? Yeah, that yeah. sucked. How did I get, how, I was here. How did I get, I get yeah, exactly. That's, no. that's awful. Who yeah. did this? <laughs> that's exactly right. So you got to look at it every single month. Uh, right. Look at it every single month and make changes to it. You know, so, yeah. you know, because a forecast isn't static, you know, it's not mm -hmm. something you compare from one to the next. It's dynamic. It's always yeah. changing. Right. And so, you know, you know that, hey, based on what we've got, I had five trucks planned and, in March, you know, guess what? I've got my inventory backup is so big. I've got 10 trucks. I'm yep. going to get 10 through there. Make that change. So now mm -hmm. we've got 10. And so now we know what our new cash position is going to look like. Or maybe yep. it went the other way. Maybe you had two. And now we're like, oh, my gosh, the cash position is going to look really bad at that you know, at, the end, at the end at the end, stay there. So, you know, you, you've got to kind of really look at that, model it. And so you can make really solid business decisions because it's really easy to make a change in March that's going to affect November than it is to make a change in November that's going to affect November. You know, you know if, yeah, if, if you're a small business, so, so one of the things I actually started doing this year, which I didn't do before, and I'm going to be honest about this, I didn't do it before, but I did start doing it this year was, is I put a, um, I put a projected column on my P&L. Mm -hmm. So before it was just live numbers on the PNL, which is yep. which is fine. It's perfectly yep. acceptable. Mm -hmm. Nobody would argue. Most people would just be impressed that I had one. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I included a um a whole column just for projected projected uh -huh. because you can use your PL, your profit and loss, how much money you're coming in, less mm -hmm. cost of goods sold if you're a manufacturer or whatever. Yep. Um and, and your other my fixed costs. And I can I can then measure one against the other as the month goes through, mm -hmm. without having a bunch of additional um, Excel Excel sheets that mm -hmm. are, are forecasting sheets. You can forecast right to your P and L. Yep. I'm sure if you're a CFO, it's probably something that you would use more closely. I'm hearing myself a little bit, a little echo on your side. Let me just see. Uh, hmm. so maybe your speaker. Okay. But um, but yeah. So since I started doing that, it actually is actually really nice because it it helps you to re establish your forecast and mm -hmm. you can go back you can go back to your master sheet with those actuals because mm -hmm. those are those are live goal numbers but yep. they're not actual numbers right so they're better for your forecasting in the sense that they make adjustments to the to the other subsequent months of your mm -hmm. financials but they're they're just as important to have as your um as in my opinion as your actual numbers what do you think about that Oh, hundred percent agree. Cause that's what we do every month. Right. So we take all the actual numbers there. Life hits us in the face, right? Yep. Unexpected happens. Then we mush that against what we actually have in our, our, our forecasted numbers. So we're always comparing mm -hmm. it against our forecast, you know, month mm -hmm. by month and then through the rest of the year. So as we're comparing it month by month, we're looking at it and saying, you know what? Hey, uh, Hey, Michael, why is revenue only, you know, why do we only have eight trucks coming through this month versus five? You know, is that going right. to be a reoccurring thing? 
or is that just a one-off thing? And so, mm -hmm. you know, as you're thinking through your head, you're looking at it and say, yeah, that's actually a one-off thing. Or so not, not a big deal. We're not going to make any changes in our forecast. Right. You know, or you might say it's a, re a real thing and it's like, well, then we need to make some modifications. So next month, let's put eight instead of five, you know, eight instead of five. And now we reprojected it out so that we have a real true number that we're actually going against. And, and that's so, so big. The fact that you're actually taking your forecast number and comparing it to your actual is a step that majority of business owners out there are not doing right now. And, and that's, yep. and that's why I made that comment. And it's like that you're doing that. That is, that is one of the biggest steps that you can make to, to really kind of guide the ship because you need to look at it as it's happening and, and yep. kind of make adjustments for it. You know, if, if you, have a company retreat. Let's say that you, you know you're remote like we are, and have a company retreat. And you're going to spend twenty five to three thousand dollars a person on this company retreat, and you have one, let's say in, in May, and you have another one in October, right? You know, about six months apart. And so you're yeah. going through that May one, and you're like, man, we're spending way too much money in, in this retreat here. Well, now you need to know that, hey, in October, I need to do one of two things, right? I need to either increase the amount of money I think we're going to spend in that one, or go the opposite, say, you know what? We spent a lot of money in May. We're going to cut down in October. Mm -hmm. And so you make those adjustments right there and then. And, and yeah. then, and, and that's really the key of forecasting because you're constantly making adjustments, but you're not doing it just on a whim, right? You, you're basing it on, you know, you know, basically dynamic information, you know, true numbers that you can look at to, to make those wise decisions. Yeah, that's a good point. And cash flow is a manager's game. Um, and, you know, there are entrepreneurs, they're the idea people who put the structure in place that have the, that are able to build the ecosystem of what they want, like very effectively. Mm -hmm. And so they, they're able to build these businesses that just, they work, they work on in theory and on paper, but the problem comes down to the, when the rubber meets the road, right? So a manager's game, cash flow is always a manager's game. Mm -hmm. Who can manage the best has the, has the best cash flow. So how do you manage the assets that you have in place? I, I wanted to make a comment on something you said earlier. So I have, um, I own um, uh, a brick and mortar business. And so yes. what we do to manage cash flow is we have a broken down to operational hours. So what we've done is we've taken um, our gross rent for the year, mm -hmm. which is how they calculate all rent anyway, in commercially. Yep. Um, we've taken um, taxes, we've taken um, you know, our fixed costs for, for a 12 month period insurance, we've divided it into broke it all the way down per day per operational hour so that we know per hour what we need to make. That's a little nerdy for most people. And most people won't do that. <laughs> I get it. You probably really like that <laughs> idea um, <laughs> because you're, you're probably a nerd like me. Right. But like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the point is like when you, if, if a business owner, small business owner, entrepreneur were to do that you really understand how much you need to make per operational hour. So yep. how many uh, per operational hour is how many hours, if you're watching this, you don't understand the concept, how, how long you're open for business in a 24 hour period, right? That's mm -hmm. a, that's an operational day. And then if you're only able, open for eight hours, each hour of those eight hours is an operational hour. So if you divide everything into that little, put all your fixed cost it does not include variable costs, but like put all your fixed costs, Mm -hmm. then you're going to be more likely like super accurate to how much you need to charge your customers, how much you need to market and how often you need to market and how much capital you need to, to spend there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you do the same thing with like, uh, pr you know, production based companies that are, you know, service based, like, you know, for instance, we do a lot of creative agency space where they're developing the big websites and you know, all that kind of stuff. And we'll break it down by employee. So we know exactly wow. the utilization percentage, you know, how, how many, how much time are they actually working on projects? what their average billable time is, you know, for a lot of them, they, whether they're flat fee or whether they're, their hourly bill, we still have a good idea what, what that billable time is. And we can break it out and say, you know, XYZ employee should be producing $200,000 to that bottom line. And, and in order to get that, we, we know that they've got, we, we, you know, you've got to be able to manage that effectively. You know, the average, we can break it down by employees. You can break it down mm -hmm. by every single employee and you can look at employees and, you know, and look at it and say, you know what, why, why is it, why is everybody doing great? But Micah, you, you're, you're lower in everything. So then we can dig in and see, you know, Hey, is this an education issue? Is it a mm -hmm. software issue? Is it something that mm -hmm. Micah is doing a little differently? And we kind of work and help it, help Micah bring that information back up. And so, you know, just like you're saying there, you can break it down overall company wise, like you're, like you just said, which is brilliant, mm -hmm. or you can break it down even at a more granular level where, you know, what each pr person should actually pr be producing and, and use it as a tool to help them out and help help bring the whole ship up with with uh, you know just kind of looking at that information.
That's actually really smart because it allows you to know if your capital applied to the human labor is actually earning you a return on your investment. So mm -hmm. like, you know, in economics, just I know that most people don't think this way, which is that what a person is really giving you when they come to work for you is they're selling their labor to you in the market. That's really what's happening. And so what a company is doing is that they're hiring people. They're actually buying labor from an individual. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever you buy, in theory, what should happen in the business market is the business owner should be buying labor and there should be a return on that labor. And yep. so what you're saying is, is that how you look at it in those production-based service companies, which I love this model, you can see directly if you're paying someone $80,000 salary, whether or not they're meeting that ROI on yep. the $80,000 salary and then take corrective action. So this is a this is a situation where the quantitative data, like the numerical data, is mm -hmm. driving the qualitative data, which is more like the survey and interview style data, which is like you take that, you go back to the employee and you say, well, your, either your production was down or oftentimes these take through it the form of like an annual review, performance review. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. why, did, why were we so off kilter with kind of what we did and how do we write the ship? And mm -hmm. then- and then from there, there's like the tough conversation. Do we take, keep this employee on? Are they actually making the money back? And so, so numerically, if, we, if we're just talking about quantitatively, what you all provide in being a virtual CFO service is mm -hmm. you already can take a look at a person's books. You have so, so the business model, right? You can take a look at the profit of a company or how much money they're generating. Yep. You already know before you even sign on a client your ROI for this client based off of what, how you perform and what you can do for them. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's because brilliant. It, yeah. We, we know the numbers, right. And so like, if you're looking at a person, you know, it, it, you know, you, you want to, you want to basically at least double the amount of money that person's bringing in. Right. So the mm -hmm. cost wise, and so you could break it out, you know, just by taking the person's total overall cost. Let's say the person's salary is a hundred thousand. They've got another twenty thousand dollars in burden, you know, the benefits and all that kind of stuff. So one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So we know that we want to make at least two hundred forty thousand dollars on that client. So you can even break it out by hours and say, you know, two thousand eighty hours is how many working hours in a year if you take, you know, the forty hours times fifty two weeks. That's your two thousand eighty. And you can say, hey, you know what? Take that take that overall cost number divided by two thousand eighty hours. Mm -hmm. Then you can do the same thing and take that overall revenue and divide that by two thousand eighty hours. So you can see exactly where you're at on a dollar per hour basis and you can make those corrective actions like you'd mentioned. So no different than what you did by taking it all the way down to the very bottom. We're, we're doing it at the higher level so that mm -hmm. we can actually have a better control over it because with most service-based companies, you, you, your, 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 your labor is your biggest expense. You know, yeah. that, that's where, that's where you're going to, that's where you're going to make or break it. It's mm -hmm. not what you spend on dues and subscriptions and the accounting fee or the attorney fee or anything like that. That's, that's just, down, down, that's down below. That's just kind of right. helping you survive. But that that dollar amount's way up there. Mm -hmm. And so that's like when I tell somebody that, hey, you know, they ask me, well, how much should I be charging an hour? You know, and it's like, well, really, the first question I ask, well, how much do you charge? How much do you pay for your employees? You right. know, because if, if I'm offshoring my entire team, well, I've got a, I've got a huge advantage. I might mm -hmm. be paying my employees twenty five dollars an hour instead of you know fifty dollars an hour, sixty dollars an hour. Well, my revenue could be a lot different. You know, it's like, well, mm -hmm. there we go. So I, now I can charge less than what somebody that's charged, that's my competitor right across the street that's charging. Or, or right. I can have the opposite. I could say, you know, I've got the, I got the most expensive team ever because they're brilliant. You know, they're doing all this great stuff. Well, I better be charging enough money to, to compensate for that brilliance. Yep. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be the $125 an hour that everyone else is charging. It better be a premium. It better be the 150 or the 160 or the 200 dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, because you mm -hmm. want to be able to recoup that same percentage based on, on 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 the on the team that you're putting out there to uh, to represent your company. So there's typically three kinds of employees: gener uh, revenue generating employees, uh, employees that service revenue, so existing customers, and then employees who support the functions. And so, um, like your methodology of breaking down some of these aspects of um, how a company thinks about uh, where to apply pressure should also mm -hmm. go into what types of employees that you should actually hire first. Right. And, and in my opinion, that is exactly what 
that that's a big black hole for small business owners oftentimes who do i hire first and then and i'm sure you've seen this when you mm -hmm. when you've had client meetings it's like well why do you have five middle managers right, and right. you have you have one person driving in revenue right mm -hmm. like yep. low hanging fruit here either mm -hmm. lay off lay off half your middle managers um, because probably two of them could do all the job all the work yep. mm -hmm. or you can um, hire more revenue generating employees and have them generate it and then and have your your managers actually just again managers manage mm -hmm. cash flow but you also need to generate the cash the, the revenue in order to, to to manage it so it's like do you find that building a team is a like mm -hmm. in the construction of like work teams is like a, a fatal flaw to some of these companies Oh, 100% because they want to get they want they want to they, they, they're an entrepreneur. They love what they're doing. They think everybody else wants to be an entrepreneur, which is completely false. And <laughs> right. they get to a point and, and they say, you know what, here's here's my five best producers. These these folks, you know, Mary, she's freaking awesome. And, and, and Barb, she's great. Mm -hmm. and Bob, awesome. The, I'm going to I'm going to promote these folks and, and, and they're going to be my managers now because they are the mm -hmm. best producers ever. And, and they do that. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens is. They find out that maybe Mary and Barb and Bob, maybe they don't want to be a manager. Maybe they've never managed before. Maybe that's just not their cup of tea. They, they love being the producer, you mm -hmm. know, and, and so it's a, it's a huge flaw where, where, where we're so quick to, to get to that middle management area that we lose sight of, you know, what got us there. You know, maybe we need to bring an outside person there. Maybe, maybe Bob needs to be half producer, half manager, you know, or, right. or gradually move into that manager role. And, and, and you're right. You know, people get mm -hmm. to that point and I, I see that, you know, it, it's funny because I see that right when they hit about two to $3 million between the $5 million mark, people do that all yeah. the time. You know, that they, they, they just jump right in there and say, you know what, here's my new team. And then they find out their new team um, isn't maybe as good. Now they're kind of stuck because right. they've got their five best producers, <laughs> all manager. Yep. And now what do they do? They can't put them back down there. That's a demotion, right? That's um, right. Or, or can you? Maybe you can. Um, or do you have to get rid of your five best producers because they're not great managers? So it, it really puts the, the owner in a real kind of a pickle when it comes to that. And so it's, it's be wary of that. I mean, as any business owner, as you're scaling, don't just assume that your best producer is going to be your best manager or be, be the next owner of your company because mm -hmm. they may not want anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and as an entrepreneur, it's hard to believe because you'd think everybody, of course, wants to be the owner. In yeah. reality, not everybody does. There are certain positions in a company that are just not made to drive revenue. And that's okay because it's all part of a larger ecosystem. Now, if you're really a thinking person and who's building a company, and now, that, that, okay, that's probably a little smug. I didn't mean that. So if, you, if you're a person who, I actually didn't mean it because- <laughs> don't be a non, don't be a non-thinking person, but you should be, which is why you're watching this. So, um, if you're a thinking person, you're going to take this piece of advice that I've just thought about now, and maybe Jody can speak to it in a minute. Which is, how long can you go without investing in uh, functions in your business that don't drive revenue, uh, positions or jobs in your business that don't drive revenue or contribute to increasing your net income or your gross or your gross income, right? And mm -hmm. can you can you maintain your organization your firm as long as you can before you start adding in support functions and and at some point the producers that jody that you're talking about mm -hmm. are these individuals who are bringing in the revenue that often have to be serviced now do you have okay so here's a question because i sometimes i get tangential do you do you have a uh, a formula that you use that corresponds to when an employee is making X amount of money that now it's time to bring in a support function for this, for this particular person or this department. Um, is it like four times, um, for instance, to produce a salary because now there's a support function attached to it. When do you, when do you typically suggest that there's, there's a support function attached to um, or support employee attached to a person who's bringing in cash? Yeah, that's that's kind of hard one to to say from from business to business. But typically, we say that an employee should earn um, about four times their salary is what you want to shoot for. So if you if you're a service based company, you full time employee, there, right? Uh, excuse me, full full time employee. Yeah, full time employee. Yeah, yep. about four times their. And, and so I would think as as soon as they're as soon as that you, you see that that's actually happening, where where they're starting to go higher than that. 
that's when you need the support to go along with it to bring it off of them. And, and so when we built our company, we based it and said, you know what? Every CFO has to be able to manage a million and a half dollars book of business. And obviously they can't manage that without having the team below them. And so right. they start out with 600,000 and they're building their team. And we keep adding people to their team so that they can actually manage that $1.5 million book of business. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and the, the nice thing about it is if you do it in, in the right way, like you're mentioning, it, it can be done and there's not, the stress isn't there on the company. The, the, right. the problem is, is that every company is a little different. You've got to kind of figure out what that stress level really is. I, I wish there was a mathematical formula, at least that I knew of, that would say, you know, hey, when you get to that three, then you move it. Maybe there is out there and I just don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, I think you have to kind of gauge each company by itself. And, be, and the reason why I say that is there's a, there's a principle out there or a law that's called Parkinson's law. And, and what that means is that if I am, I'm going to work to, to the capacity that I've got time. And so if I've got one company that I'm, let's say that I'm managing, let's just look, let's look at the summit model here. Let's say I'm managing one client and um, mm -hmm. I, I, that's the only client I have. Guess how many hours I'm going to put in that client? 40. <laughs> I'm going to work 40 hours. I'm going to work my butt off. I'm going to think, oh my gosh, this is great. And then guess what? Jody just gave me another client. So now I've got two clients. Well, guess how many hours I'm going to work total for those two clients? 40. <laughs> so now right. I figure it out and, I, and I'm thinking, okay, so I'm, I'm figuring out some efficiencies and I'm working it out. Mm -hmm. I don't need help yet. Right. Cause I'm, I'm got, mm -hmm. I've got everything covered. Right? right. And so then, so Jody all of a sudden he's like, Oh, you're doing such a great job. I'm going to give you two more clients. <laughs> and so now it's like, Oh, Oh geez, I got four clients now. And right. I'm like, okay, so I'm busting my butt. Guess how many hours I'm working? Not 120 hours. I'm working 40. And, and it right. continues on because you develop the efficiencies, you figure out what's important. Then you get to a point where, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I, I've got I, I'm, I'm, I've got eight clients now and I'm doing everything myself. I'm truly thinking I might have to work more. So guess what you try to do? You, you, you start leveraging people. Mm. And, and so that's when you start the leverage. And with that leverage, you're teaching people how to do your job. And, and that's the key to any kind of anybody's mm -hmm. success is, is become irrelevant. You know, be Mr. Irrelevant or Mrs. Right. Irrelevant. You know, make your job so that somebody underneath you can do it. And you're pushing stuff down to that to that person. You're training them. You're not mm -hmm. abdicating. You're, you're delegating, right? You're, you're teaching them how to do that job, right? And you're and you're, you're overseeing them. And so now Jody comes through and says, I, I got two more clients for you. Like, I can handle two more clients. No problem. And so right. you're, you're going through. So now you've built your book of business that way and you've got 15 clients. And you're thinking, mm -hmm. you know, now I'm thinking, man, is can he, can he do any more? And all of a sudden he comes up to me and says, you know what? give me two more clients. I am ready to go. I got this thing humming. I've got my processes in place. I'm figuring it out. And I guess how much time he's, he's putting into it. 40, 45 hours a week, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. Right. Yeah. And that's all part of that Parkinson's Parkinson syndrome or not syndrome, but Parkinson's law is that, you know, you, you, you figure out how to work within that, con, that, that time constraint. It, it mm -hmm. doesn't just add hours to it. You figure it out. And, and so that's what every business owner has to do, right? They've got to figure out what is the tipping point for the team? You know, is yep. it, you know, hey, can they work on eight trucks solid, you know, or can they work on six? And that's that's the tipping point. And, and that whatever the tipping point is, you've got to figure out, hey, this is what the team can do. And don't base mm -hmm. it on one person because everybody's right. a lot different, right? My right. capacity is a lot different than your capacity is a lot different than the next person's capacity. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at a person by person basis to get, get an overall. But then you get you can kind of blend them all in and say, yeah, typically this is how we do it. And then you kind of develop that support staff underneath them. So I, I would be very hesitant to say, hey, there's a formula that's going to say, mm -hmm. hey, X equals Y plus Z, because Parkinson's law is going to take completely the opposite. You right. know, had we started out and I said, you know what, a CFO could only handle $600,000. That's it. I know it's it. Well, guess what? Today, a CFO would only handle $600,000. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, because right. self-imposed a law. Or, or a principle that is, is based in, in fault in falsehoods. And so that's why you've got to understand what can that person actually do. And, and that's the beauty of working on a, a like a value-based pricing or a flat fee pricing, because you, you figure out all those different things versus an hourly bill, you just do it and and you charge the client and you never get better, you know, that type of thing. So uh, efficiencies are, are the key to key to that. So like I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily go formula based. Yeah. Uh, if there's one great, I'd love to know what that is, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I well, but what you say makes sense because the the essentially business ownership and entrepreneurship is about solving problems, mm -hmm. um, identifying holes where there's where there's pressure points, and stress testing your business so that 
before you get to the point where the pipe bursts, yep. you're relieving the pressure already. Um, I developed a stress test for business owners and it's, it's it doesn't address things like um, financial specifically because sure. I mean, those things are, I hate to say easy, but they're, they're easy. It's just numbers. Mm -hmm. Numbers don't change. So right. I built the stress test because it's like, if, if you don't understand how your business is supposed to work, and if you can't build a functioning, if you can't scaffold a business that works from a good foundation, then it's just a house of cards. And then everything comes falling down. And the next thing you know, you're having to, to rob Peter to pay Paul to get the person in to do stuff and work at the last minute to try to make it work. And then it becomes a fire drill versus just something that you had already prepared for. Mm -hmm. um, and so this the stress test that I made was to identify these gaps so that when you're bigger, as you grow, that you can see where the holes might come up. Now, you kind of did this with digital companies by writing your book, um, Dollars and Cents digital dollars and cents, yep. where you help them to understand a financial roadmap um, as they kind of move through their journey. And mm -hmm. so why digital c companies, first of all, mm -hmm. and um, tell me about the roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. Digital companies is kind of funny. Um, it, it wasn't uh, strategic in nature. <laughs> it was the <laughs> fact that um, when I, I just love marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I love sales. I love marketing. I, I, it's just that's in my blood. Accounting, I have no idea why I ever picked accounting, believe it or not. <laughs> it's probably my least favorite of, of all, <laughs> right. all my responsibility. Yeah. But uh, so I lo love marketing, love sales. And it just happened that, that one of my very first um, virtual CFO firms back in 2000, it's probably 2009, 2010, that I couldn't really go physically to their office. Mm -hmm. Was a company out of Rhode Island. Now, I, I, I live, my headquarters was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, northeast corner of Indiana there. And, and this, this company is Rhode Island. And, right. and they, they, they saw, they saw our website, they loved it. And they thought, you know, Hey, um, you know, they, they called and I'm, I'm on the phone with them. I'm like, is so like, Hey, we're in Rhode Island. I'm like, okay. And, and I uh, would, they asked me the question, would you ever have to visit us? And I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, would you want me to visit you? And like, not really. And I, absolutely not. <laughs> I would never have to visit you. Right. <laughs> That's so hilarious. That became our first client. Right. So it was right. like our first, true client that we like, I don't want to see your face. <laughs> yeah. If I had said that, I'd have been, you know, I'd been like, Oh, this isn't going to work out. I can't drive to Rhode Island day, you know, every day, but uh, they, they thought this is great. And so, you know, they, they were, they allowed us to actually do that. And, and the cool thing is, is that the, the people were cool. It was a real mm -hmm. cool company. They're one of the first fully remote companies in the world. They only had 25. Uh, they were one of the first 25 companies actually fully mm -hmm. remote. We ended up being one of the first 125. Um, because we took all their knowledge and, and nice. learned from them. And, and, and actually that's how we became, that's how we decided to go remote. But before that, you know, it was like, you know, Hey, what, you know, you know, th this company was, it, it was so cr great and so easy to work with. And they're like, you know, Hey, we've got a, we've got a buddy that owns a shop down here. Would you be interested in being their CFO? I'm like, mm -hmm. absolutely. And so we, mm -hmm. we brought another marketing firm on. It was like, this is pretty cool. These people really listen to what we say and they're working. Our message is really resonating with them and, and they're following it and they're seeing success. Right. And then I got a, a, an opportunity to uh, speak in front of about 30 uh, companies and, and deliver the, the profit message. You know, hey, here's how to be profitable. Here's how you need to break things out. You know, and I broke it out by person, by company and, and, and just showed them really quick in an hour talk on how to, how to actually be profitable. And it was like, wow, this is great. They loved it. Twitter went wild. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're asked to do this over and over and over again. And so we're teaching all these companies in the in the creative agency space how to do it and how right. to be profitable. So that's how we went. We got into the creative agency space field. Now, that could have easily be, been the dentist field, you know, or the mm -hmm. pest control field or sure. any other real niche out there. It didn't have to be that one. That was just the one that we resonated with. And it was just because of me. It was because of my background, my love for marketing. I did their website stuff all the way up until you know, right. until I couldn't do it anymore, until I had to hand it off. And that was like, oh, I don't want to hand it off. That's my yeah. favorite part of my business. Right. <laughs> you know, it's it's in your blood. And, you know, and I think when you're in business and if you're a small business owner, entrepreneur, like when you when you've had to put your hand in everything to make your company company grow, like you never can never get out of that. It's it's, it's kind of like a part of you. You just you end up becoming it is if you were to ever just create a resume, mm -hmm. it would it would be a resume of an entire company that's just in your in your resumes because you're just doing so much and it, it's true. Um, let me ask you this. Cause you mentioned something when we first started. Yeah. And it was about 
buckets, business owners choosing buckets for mm -hmm. bank accounts. Mm -hmm. This is a concept very similar to Mike Michalowicz's book, Profit First. Oh, where, sure, he talks, sure. where he talks about specifically um, his the way his concept is that you should always take a profit mm -hmm. um, from the very beginning, even if you're not necessarily profitable. And then you you learn how to manage your business out of um, whatever is left over from after you take a mm -hmm. profit. And of course, the size of your company um, all the way down to, um, you know, millions of dollars company, it's, it's all part of it. And, mm -hmm. and like he has a, a, a schedule and formula for how do you get there? Mm -hmm. um, but he talks about specific buckets of um, that you should have in terms of, you should have checking accounts for all this marketing, payroll, taxes, like all the stuff that you have. Um, can you speak to like, as from a C CFO standpoint, can you speak to like how important it is to have those multiple accounts and get away from the thought of having a singular single stream account, or maybe if you only have two that you use um, and why it's important from like an, a, from a, a cost control standpoint and a cash flow standpoint? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, great question. So, um, profit first, great book, great uh, philosophy, uh, but it's not really one that we we, we mm -hmm. actually follow because they're more on a cash basis philosophy where we look at right. accruals. Mm -hmm. um, accrual base means that we're recognizing revenue when you've earned it and, and we're kind of matching against the exact expenses. And so when we create right. that forecast, it's really based on what you're earning, when you're earning. And that's kind of how our KPIs drive everything. And that's kind of how we can monitor uh, the green light, red light. You know, are things going right, right. or are things going wrong? Do we need, need help? Mm -hmm. uh, with with the with the uh, the actual bank accounts, though, um, we, we we do recommend three bank accounts that we, we, we that we had mentioned, and, and the one's just the operating account. And that's where all the money flows in and out of. Yep. The cash reserve account is the one that's making the interest and earning the money, and that's kind of where the excess money flows over to, and, and that's going to earn some money. So you don't want a million. You don't you don't want to have a million bucks sitting in a a bank account that's not earning interest. And that's why, that's why I mentioned before that that's mm -hmm. got to be that interest bearing. And then the tax account is the other one I feel is super important to have uh, because mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it's, it's there, it's out of sight, out of mind. You're not, you're not leveraging it, you know, with hiring new people, you're not thinking about it when you want to buy that new something. Um, it, it's not even in the equation. So the money's out of sight, out of mind in that third one. And then the fourth one we have isn't really a bank account, but it's the line of credit. Uh, right. We tell everybody that you want to have a line of credit e equal to whatever percentage that you decide that's important for your business. So if you said, you know what, hey, based on a risk reward, I think we should need about 15% in the bank. Well, then your line of credit should be roughly around 15%. So it kind of doubles that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, if you're in any kind of hardship, you've got something you can borrow against. Right. And, and one tip for the line of credit is, you know, everybody, everybody thinks they have to renew their line of credit every year. Renew it, put it on a two-year cycle. So it renews every two years as opposed to one. And Smart. the reason why I say that is because if you go to a, if you go into bad times, guess what's gonna be really difficult for you to do, if not impossible, is to get a line mm -hmm. of credit. Mm -hmm. And so yep. anytime we go through like a recessionary period, which is a typical cycling period that usually lasts what nine months to about a year and a half, you can yep. usually get through that two-year cycle with your line of credit. And so that's why we say always renew every two years. You'll have it set up for a two year cycle, but th those are it's, it's brilliant. Especially if you got that line of credit in January of 2020, yep. right? <laughs> the next January is 2022 and you already passed two years of the pandemic, but you had access to that already. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and that's why, and, and again, never, never be afraid to ask for more in the line of credit. The worst mm -hmm. thing they're going to say is no. And if they say no, ask another bank. You know, it's just a bank. It's just cash. You know, you'll, you'll find somebody that get, get that, that will give you a line of credit equal to what you want it to be or or close to it. And I would say I, I've not had a bank that, from any of our clients turn down a two year renewal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it's just less paperwork for them. They make a little bit more money instead of four hundred dollars a year for it. That's maybe six hundred dollars or something like yeah. that. And it's just a good deal overall. And like I said, get you through that hardship there. So those are the four ones that we highly recommend. Anything after that, you know, for, for our clients that we've seen, it just becomes really difficult. So that's yeah. why that forecast is so important because the forecast is going to hold you to everything that th those basically bank yeah. accounts did. And so, you, you know, like you had mentioned, you, you you've got a, you, you've got every line attached to that, you know, the projection that you had mentioned there, that's mm -hmm. what you have to do every single month and you're doing it basically you're accomplishing the exact same thing right. without having a separate bank account for it you know if, if my one budget's going over like i mentioned you adjust it 
So next month it doesn't go over or goes under next month. Or if you mm -hmm. can't do that, then you've got to figure out how to adjust your model a little bit. But like I said, you always should be targeting that 15% bottom line, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what. And, 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 you know, I've had people put forecasts together and it comes down and says, Oh, we're 3% or we're, we're, we're going to be five negative 5%. Okay. It's like, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not how that works. Right. <laughs> you figure it out. You start changing things around so that you get to that 15% bottom line. Just had a meeting with a client. I don't have many clients. I've got a client that I've been a friend of mine for geez, 20 years and mm -hmm. he runs a cabinet manufacturing company and we're going through and he's like, Oh, it looks like I'm going to have a bad year next year. I'm like, what do you mean you're gonna have a bad year next year? <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> next year hasn't even happened. <laughs> you know, that's funny. We're adjusting things, and so we're adjusting things through. And it's like, wow, you know, if I hit these numbers, and if I do this, if I make this mm -hmm. cut, if I get my material costs down, you know, just three percent, man, I could have a really, I could have a twenty percent bottom line. That's 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 pretty amazing. You know, that's gonna really help yep. me pay all all this debts. But, you know, you, you've got to have that mentality. And, and that's what Profit First is, is basically pushing. Hey, have that mentality that's to really focus right. on that bottom line and, and look at it on a regular basis. And that's kind mm -hmm. of what the cash accounts do. You know, and that's what, you know, Profit Sense accounts are all doing. They're doing mm -hmm. the exact same thing, making sure that you stay within that budgeted area so you can hit your your your, your, your bottom line. Yeah. So, uh, so a couple of things from what you said and then the last thing from me, which is basically – um, you're, there is a law of diminishing returns on how many checking accounts you open. So when I started, so I, I, I did exactly what you're saying about opening the multiple checking accounts and I went way too far. I was like, you know, a fat kid in candy store. Right. I, yep. I had like, like, I think I had like, I was up to like 12 or something. It was, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. but unless you have staff accountants, you can't manage 12 accounts. It's, <laughs> it's way too hard. And then mm -hmm. I just thought I started closing. The, I don't even know why I went to 12 um, I was like, well, I'll, I'll open them just in case I need them for this or that, right? Yep. And yep. So, so now I have a, I have a cash, uh, I have a sweep account, and for everyone listening, all my revenue gets deposited into one account, yep. and then I sweep out into my operating. So I actually separate the operating and the sweep account. So perfect. I'll, I'll sweep just because there's nothing attached to the sweep account, right? Mm -hmm. No, like um, auto pays or debit cards or anything linked to that. The cash could come right. out from. So I have a cash sweep. And then the cash goes out to the um, operating or goes out to the payroll, the marketing. And then that's kind of how I've, I've dealt, but I, I was able to reduce it down. Um, but, but the one thing that you said, which was interesting was talk to the bank. You know, I think, I think for people who haven't done it yet, the banks are scary. It like talking to the bank right. is scary. They're, mm -hmm. they're going to say no, they're heartless, they're cruel. And I think a lot of people get this message from, frankly, the media, they think that yep. they want to talk to the bank, like they're just super cold. It's like, I remember I was working for a line of credit with the bank locally. And I said, so what do I need? They go, oh, we just need your, we just need your P&L from last year. And then we just need you to write a letter and just explain to us what you're going to do with the money. And it's like, well, what else? They're like, that's it. Like, you know, that, yep. and, and it's not what people think. If you, if you can give almost like court, if you can give a reasonable explanation, as to how you're going to grow their money, and if they believe you, essentially based off mm -hmm. of the numbers that you've already that you already produced, then you're golden. You don't really have to do much. You know, you just have a have to have a business that ex exists. Have to have a a good reason why you need the money. A good strategy behind how you're going to take their money and actually grow it, and then pay it back to them. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 very kind of I don't want to say archaic. It's a very ancient, it's still a very ancient way of, of giving mm -hmm. people money, right? I think that is 2023. So we just assume that banks are like, oh, we just, we run it through this magic machine over here and spit it out. There's someone who has to meet with you to talk about it. There's someone who has to sign off on it. Like, and depending on the bank you have, if the mm -hmm. smaller the bank, there's still people literally signing off on these things, yep. flipping mm -hmm. through your papers, reading your letters. It's, it's not as, the banking industry is not as, I don't think, as modern as people assume it is. Right. Has that been your experience? A hundred percent. And I would say that um, probably my two best friends throughout the whole thing have been bankers, you know, people mm -hmm. that uh, I've really developed a really strong relationship with over time. And, and, you know, because you, it, it's not, it wasn't purposely doing it that way. It's just, that I've been hanging around them, right? We're talking yeah. to them. They help me out. We're going golfing. We're doing all the, all the things and, and they're really becoming part of who I am. And it, and it, just like you said, it's like, you know, it's really simple. If I needed a line of credit or I need something, I just went in and said, yeah, here's what I need. They'll say, yeah, here's what I, here's the five things that we need. Boom, boom, boom. That here it is. 
okay, here's your line of credit or your loan or whatever that whatever you might be doing. And it's it's a fairly simple process. If I were to do that same process with somebody I didn't know, it's going to be mm-hmm. a little bit more light lengthy, right? Because now you, right. you don't have that trust. You don't have that relationship and you've got to maybe jump through some more hoops. But the thing about having a, a person, a banking person that you've you, is your go-to person is they know your track record. They know that, Hey, when you said you're going to do something, you did it. You followed every, every step, you know, and when that hiccup happened, here's what you did. You went here, 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 here. Mm-hmm. You didn't let it get out of, got get out of control when, when the, when, 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 when the bad thing happened, you know, th- those are the things that that banker understands, knows and, and knows from your track record mm-hmm. and they go to bat for you and they'll, mm-hmm. they'll go to bat for you big time. Whereas That's true. Maybe somebody that you don't know may not go as bad, go to bat for you because they just don't have the track record there. So highly recommend, you know, having a, a bank, you know, someone in the banking field, just being, you know, just learning, you know, knowing them, going out to dinner with them, taking them out for lunch. You know, the bankers love doing that yeah. kind of stuff. You know, I highly recommend it. You know, and, 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 um, the other thing I, I, I experienced that I noticed too, that happens is that, um, if you're really organized with your finances mm-hmm. and they don't have to do much work, not saying that they're lazy, but if they don't have to do much, well, let me ask you for this. Oh, you don't have that. Oh, I'm surprised that you have that. It actually puts you in a better light because mm-hmm. they're, they're more willing to give you a break because you appear organized. If you have like receipts under a shoe box and you're like, well, let me, let me come up with the P and L really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, versus already having it to generate and give to them. Yep. That those things make a big difference. So by organizing your finance, by bringing in a C, uh, virtual CFO like Summit um, and and um, Jody's guys are like, in order to when you have that stuff all put together already, like it opens up another whole side of doing business and finance for you. If they if they believe, because a lot of it's belief, right? They have to yep. believe that you as a company are organized and that you can you can return back to them the money that it, mm-hmm. it all comes it frankly all comes down to let me look in your eye. Do I believe that you can return back to me the money that I'm going to give you? hundred percent. I would even extend that a little further. I'd say definitely for banking, but when you go to sell your company down the road, mm-hmm. if, if the investor comes and says, Hey, I'd like to see this. And you're like, here it is. Boom. Here's the link to my website. Here's all my stuff. Or, you know, here's the five things that you want. And, and it doesn't take you long to produce any of that stuff. Oh my gosh, the multiples you're going to get are a lot bigger than the multiples you get if, if you got to do that shoebox thing where they can't trust your information. The more they can trust there, the more they're going to be willing to go out and give you a five times or six times or seven times multiple mm-hmm. where the industry may be at three or four. I mean, it, it's, it's completely based on having all that information at available, understanding it where you can tell your story and, and, and just not saying, you know, yeah, we sell this and here's our profit and Oh, I kind of got lucky. You know, it's not that right. it's like, you know, Hey, here's, here's the purpose. Here's where we got it. Here's where it is. And here's all the information to support it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And just so you know, if you're watching or listening to this uh, podcast, I did a video, I had a, a growing your business through acquisitions expert on Ryan Goral. Um, Click here somewhere in here and I'll put the video card up so that you'll be able to click that episode. I'll also have a link to that episode in the description um, with all the other links that I'll be providing you for this episode, how you can grow your business through acquisition. And we talk mm-hmm. about what things that you need in order to get yourself organized so that you can grow through acquisitions. All this stuff kind of bridges together. Um, Jody, where can people find you if there's a business owner that we get business owners across the revenue spectrum here, anywhere from $500,000 to um, uh, multi-million dollars, where can they find mm-hmm. you if they want to inquire more? Yeah, what I would do is uh, you can either check our website out at www.summitcpa.net, S-U-M-M-I-T, cpa.net. We went .net, not instead of .com. Didn't want to pay the extra money for it, so we, we, we stayed there. And then, or, or just simply set, drop me an email at Jody, J-O-D-Y, at summitcpa.net. I'd be happy to schedule a uh, one-hour consultation with anybody about anything and uh, just kind of help them out in any way I can. Awesome. And those links will be in the description to this video and the podcast as well. So you'll be able to do that. Jody, you are awesome, man. It's 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 a joy to be able to geek out about finance with somebody <laughs> in business, someone who loves it. And, you know, because, you know, finance is just a, it's scary for some people, but it's just an aspect of doing business. And if you have that nailed down, then it really does affect other decisions that you make. It's a cause and effect kind of relationship where it, it, you really does, you, you really understand about how you have to, where to apply marketing and how to hire and when to hire and who to hire and how much uh, you need to pay somebody. Like all of that stuff is all wrapped up in the finances. Yep. So 
Thank you for coming on today. I appreciate that. Go check out Jody and Summit um, CPA Group. Um, again, their links will be in the description of the podcast. Uh, Jody, thank you for coming today. And um, I am definitely want to have you back on because as news breaks and there's people who are in the realm, it's, it's important for us to kind of get um, some expectations or some, excuse me, some answers from people who know exactly what they're talking about. So we'd love to have you back on. Mike, you've been great. I really enjoyed it. I'd love to come back on. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so when it comes to um, business, we talked about financing um, with Jody. We talked about how it is that you can actually, um, what are some of the specific things you need to do to maximize profits and to minimize your taxes and how you can really get into the cash flow game. Jody was an exceptional guest because he has a lot of experience um, in helping businesses develop financial roadmaps and plans so that they can deliver it in a way that actually puts their business on the profit side, on the positive side, which is great. However, you may be listening to this and you have not incorporated yet. And so if you know that corporation, by incorporating, you get special breaks on your taxes. Um, you get tax, uh, some tax benefits. Of course, you should talk to your accountant about it. But Northwest Registered Agent is one of those companies that help you to actually register your business, form it into an LLC, enjoy the benefits of pass-through income, and what those things can do for you. The eighth wonder of the world, maybe ninth, probably ninth because compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Um, but go to uh, Northwest. The link will be in the description of this video and in the podcast. Northwest Registered Agent. They will act as your registered agent. They will help you form your LLC to get your business started if you don't have one. And they'll make sure that your business is ready to go. So then you can then pull in someone like Jody and Summit CPA and hire them so they can actually help you keep the money once you've actually built the company. So thank you for watching today. Um, we have a lot of good guests coming up. I mean, you, you are here for Jody, so you should really um, take a look at some of the other guests that are coming up on the Common Sense Show. If you haven't liked and subscribed to the video, if you really enjoyed this comment, you should subscribe, you should like, and then let me know your thoughts about the interview today in which we learned in the comment section. And I might take your comment and I actually might, might talk about it in one of my own personal live streams that I do. All right. Well, thank you for watching today and I'll talk to you soon.